Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your host, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir and joining me as always is our co-host Austin Davidson. Hey yo. It's season three, episode 66. The Pittsburgh Steelers season is over, but the NFL season goes on. Uh, the playoffs beginning this weekend, we've got, as uh, is normally the case, two games on Saturday and two games on Sunday. But obviously, uh, before we get into all that, as we typically like to talk about the playoffs, whether or not the Steelers are in it, this will be the first time that the Steelers have not been in it. Uh we, let's let's talk a little bit about kind of where we left off before because we had kind of wrapped up the Bengals game and we talked a little bit about the season, but we had talked mostly about Antonio Brown. And obviously uh, it's been quite a volatile situation, uh, but I guess a little bit more time removed. Uh, are you feeling any differently? Have you been able to process it at all? Or do you have any further thoughts since uh, we last spoke? No, not really. This this uh, season was still a uh, failure at the highest point. It's just, uh, really, I don't have any other different thoughts since we wrapped it up with the Bengals game. How about you? I'm in complete agreement as far as the season goes. As far as Antonio Brown himself goes in that situation, I am starting to get the growing feeling that the Steelers are still going to try to trade him. And there's a very specific window where they can try to trade him. I forget exactly when it is, but it's not going to be for a little while. But I'm starting to get the feeling the Steelers are going to try to move on from him. Yeah, it's going to be rough. They have that five-day window in March. I believe it's March 3rd through the 8th. But, um, yeah, it's going to be very It's going to be very tough. <laughs> it's going to be a very hectic uh, five days as they try to trade him. Because there's some sort of bonus that kicks in, which is like, I think you said, like five days after the new league year begins. So it's a very delicate situation, and I don't know. I don't know. It, it almost seems like there's big, like Mike Tomlin kind of hinted at big changes coming. And, you know, he has largely been criticized in years prior about maybe not being disciplined enough, allowing too much to go on in the room. And here we are talking today after his press conference. I feel like, based on what he was saying, he's he's not afraid to make changes, not just with the players and coaches, but maybe with himself too. And that could include maybe a culture change or at least a shift in culture that doesn't, it's maybe a little more disciplinarian, a little less uh, laissez-faire, if you will. Um, that would include probably shipping people like Antonio Brown out. What do you think? I mean, if that's what it takes to win, I'm, I'm for it. I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure how it's going to work out. I mean, obviously, I, I still want the Steelers to hold on to Antonio Brown, even though he's he's kind of a jerk. But uh, if, if they think it's going to help them win more and uh, and win those games that are like against teams under point five hundred, uh, sure, let's go for it. I'm in complete agreement with you as far as that goes. But really, just a strange situation because again, there now that we've had time to analyze it, you can kind of go like, oh. Uh, I can see where there have been problems before, but uh, it still seems very strange on the whole. And it's it, it's almost, I, I've had some more time to process it, and I'm sure obviously you have too, but it still seems so, just so strange. Yeah, it's just not many of this happens with where your two uh, elite guys, your best guys are both not good with the media and are just, I, I don't even know. So moving on, the Steelers have made a couple new additions uh, with futures contracts. They signed former, uh, I guess his uh, hard knocks uh, star, <laughs> Brogan Roback, uh, formerly of the Browns, I believe, right? I, I believe so. So I, I didn't watch hard knocks, so I didn't uh, I didn't know much about him. And they also added uh, Karuan White, who was an undrafted free agent rookie from West Virginia this year. Uh, he went to high school in Pittsburgh, so he's from the other area, and he's brothers with Kaiser White, a rookie that I looked at pre-draft to safety. And he's also the brother of Kevin White, who is uh, the Chica one of the receivers for the Chicago Bears, uh, or was uh, who had previously. Sorry, oh my goodness, 
Kevin White is the Bears receiver, and uh, Karu, Karuan White has spent time with the Seahawks and Bengals practice squads before signing this futures contract. Either of these names pop out at you? No. <laughs> Neither of them. Brogan Roback is a camp on. There's no denying that when you still have uh, Ben, Josh Dobbs, and um, Lisa Rudolph. Just the camp on from, from Roback. And for all, it could be something, but I highly doubt it. The Steelers made another move uh, today. They let go line, outside linebackers coach Joey Porter. Uh, long time in the making, I suppose. He, We talked about the possibility of him being let go. He is the first name to uh, to meet the X. Yeah, I mean, I think we both wanted it, so it's a good thing at the end of the day. I mean, it is unfortunate because he's a former player and he was a popular former player, but at the end of the day, you just didn't feel like you were getting enough growth from the outside linebackers. Tough decision for Mike Tomlin to make. I know him and Porter were close, but uh, probably the right decision going forward. A lot of eyes have been paid attention to former Steelers out linebacker Kevin Green as far as a potential replacement. Do you like Kevin Green to return? Yeah, that would be solid. I think that would be great if Kevin Green could return or moving Keith Butler to his old position, but Kevin Green would be dope too. I would agree. Uh, so all pro rosters have been announced uh, this uh, this afternoon. Center Marquise Pouncey was the only Steeler to make it as the second team uh, center. David DeCastro was snubbed, and Antonio Brown also didn't make it. And if you heard uh, Peter King's response, he said that he changed his vote after all this stuff with Antonio Brown went down. Now, I know that Brown has made a fool of himself lately, but do you think that should factor into being voted an All-Pro or not? No. That's like a Terrell Owens like, move. Like, why Terrell Owens didn't get all fame? Like, they're considering stuff that's not, shouldn't be considered part of the, the process. I mean, Granted, he did say that he didn't play like 6% of the season or what, whatever it was, and that was his reason. It wasn't for the antics uh, uh, altogether. It was just because he missed the game when his team needed him the most, and uh, that weighed down on it. But still, I mean, missing a game, he led the league in touchdowns, uh, receiving touchdowns, I'm sorry, by two over Eric Ebron and Devontae Adams. If it's against the Bengals, he might get another touchdown and lead by three. I mean, I, granted, I think he was not involved in receiving yards uh, when pressure on all the tight ends and, and wide receivers, but and I think he was nine in catches, but I feel like if you're leading the league in touchdowns, like you should get a little bit more respect. I think he should have made second-team flex, uh, if I'm being honest with you, but I mean, it is what it is. I understand both sides of the argument. Uh, you know, the whole Terrell Owens argument earlier this year about off-the-field stuff shouldn't matter for this kind of thing, but... At the same time, I can appreciate where King was coming from, where he purposely did not play uh, 6% of the season, one game, a must-win game. So I can understand both sides of it. But at the end of the day, I don't think it should impact really the decision uh, at the end there. Uh, Steelers receiver Ryan Switzer just had some surgery. We're not sure what it is, but he's cleaned something up. I remember he was on the injury report uh, a few weeks ago. Do you remember what it was he was injured with? I feel like it was his ankle. Uh, I, I think I think he had an ankle injury earlier in the season. I, I'm, that's my guess. I think it's an ankle surgery. So don't be surprised to see a lot of Steelers players getting minor surgeries to clean stuff up now that the season is over. All right. Uh, let's get into the playoffs, Austin. It'll be a little weird. I'm not going to lie doing this, knowing that the Steelers aren't going to be in the playoffs. It's still very bizarre, especially considering where the Steelers were just at the midway point of the season. Yeah, it really is. It sucks, too. I mean, and this episode's going to run really long because typically in the past two years, we only had to do three games on this one, and then we did the Steelers separate. Now we got to do four. All right, so starting at Saturday, the 435 game, the six seed, 10-6 and six Colts at the number three seed, Houston Texans, are, who are 11-5. and five. They split their regular season matches this season. The Texans won a matchup of two 0-3 teams, 37-34 to 34 in Indianapolis back in week four. I bet at that time nobody thought either team was making the playoffs. And then in week 14, the Colts came back with a win at Houston, narrowly edging the Texans 24-21. And both teams are 9-2 and in their last 11 games. These teams have a laundry list of injuries. Uh, <laughs> I, can take, uh, I can take a look at the Colts here. I, I'll just list the players with injuries and what they are. So Clayton Gathers has a knee injury. Ryan Grant has a toe injury. T.Y. Hilton has an ankle injury. Tyquan Lewis has a knee injury. 
Zach Pascal has a knee injury. Darius Fountain has an ankle injury. Malik Hooker has a hip injury. Dontrell Inman with a shoulder. Ryan Kelly with a neck. Jabal Sheard with a knee. Anthony Walker with a shoulder. Jordan Wilkins with a knee and ankle. Eric Ebron uh, was a coach's decision for rest. He's good to go. Darius Leonard has an ankle injury. Anthony Costanzo has a knee injury. And J.J. Wilcox has an ankle injury. Uh, the only players with designations are Clayton Gathers, who is questionable, Ryan Grant, who is out, T.Y. Hilton, who is questionable, Tyquan Lewis, who is out, Zach Pascal, who is questionable, Dontrell Inman, who is questionable, Jabal Sheard, who is questionable, and finally, J.J. Wilcox, who is questionable. Oh, man. The Texans also have quite a long list. They have linebacker Dylan Cole with a wrist injury, Kiki Kuti, or Kute, uh, the wide receiver. He has a hamstring injury. Nose tackle Brandon Dunn has an ankle. Zach Fulton, the center, has a hand injury. Andre Hall has a, uh, uh, an ankle injury. He's a safety. DeAndre Hopkins has an ankle. Buddy Howell has a hamstring. Jonathan Joseph has a neck. Uh, oh, how do you say that name? Senio Kelimete has a knee and rib injury. Bernardrick McKinney has a heel injury. Justin Reed has a wrist injury. And J.J. Watt has an elbow and knee injury. Kute and Howell have, are both questionable with their respective injuries. Oh, man. That was that took a lot that that took a lot to get through. <laughs> Man, these teams are banged up. Yeah, that's that's a lot of people. I mean, luckily for the Texans, they're looking a little better with only two, uh, two guys with injury designations. But I mean, these guys are going to be feeling it. Like these guys don't have injury designations because it's playoffs. They're, they're saying we're going, and that's what's going to be. I'm sure if this was a regular season game, a little there would be more. Uh, designations for some of these guys, but I mean, these guys know what this is. This is playoffs. You gotta play. All right, so let's start with uh, a team that was supposed to be in a rebuild mode in the Colts. New head coach Frank Reich has engineered a full turnaround for a team that was one and five earlier this year. Uh, Andrew Luck has been the heart of that change. Obviously, the dark horse MVP candidate has set the second highest career marks uh, for himself in passing yards and passing touchdowns. And this after barely being able to throw football earlier this summer. So let's talk a little bit about Luck and how he has played this season. Well, Andrew Luck has been playing really high level. I mean, uh, he, he I didn't expect it. I didn't think he would be able to make a return to football. And when Luck actually did play, I always thought he was overrated. I always thought he wasn't like wasn't as good as people said. I felt like he had a, most seasons that where people thought he was really good. It was just like what Ben Roethlisberger's season was like this year, where Ben Roethlisberger's a, a Pro Bowl player this year, or uh, AP like that. Uh, he, he threw a lot, and it caused him to throw a lot of interceptions, but it, it gave pretty stats. This is the first year where I saw Andrew Luck, and I could say that his stats match how his play is. Like, he's not, he's playing really well. And I feel like he's, uh, his return to football was, was a great one. I, I, I don't, I, he must have been studying in the offseason. Obviously, he couldn't to really do physical work with his arm, but he probably used that time to study the game and try and get better in that way, and it, I think it's paying off. I feel like he's making less uh, less young mistakes and stuff like that, and I mean, I guess he's had a lot of time to really look this stuff over, but uh, I, I really feel like he could be dangerous this playoff. Now, uh, I will say he was only one interception behind Ben Roethlisberger, so he's still prone to turnovers but his interception percentage is just under his career average, so he is taking a little bit better care of the football. Where he really helped himself this year was his touchdown percentage. It's all it's 0.9% higher than his career average of 5.2. Uh, he's at 6.1 this year. So he's really been efficient towards the red zone, and obviously he stacked up a lot of yards. And really, obviously, the key has been the protection for him because we know throughout his career he put up a lot, but he was getting hit all the time. And uh, his sack percentage over his career, listen to these numbers, 6.1, 5.3, 4.2, 4.9, 7.0. And this year it's at 2.7, which is almost half of his career average of 5% uh, five sack, uh, sack rate. So uh, really just the key, as we learned with Ben Roethlisberger in the middle of his career, if you protect your quarterback, he'll really he'll really show you what he can do. Yeah, I mean, props to the offensive line coach. Uh, last year, they were last league in sacks given up, 32. This year, they're at number one. They went, they flipped it just like the Rams did on offense last year. And uh, I have to give their O line coach props. And I mean, Quinton Nelson was a great pick for them. I still think Quinton Nelson should have been picked by the Broncos, 
I, I feel like they're probably feeling that mistake as well. But I mean, Bradley Chubb's okay. But back to the point at hand is they just they turned it around on the offensive line, and I give that off to their coach. I actually don't know his name, but uh, he did re- he worked really well with uh, the offensive line this year. Really turned them around. I mean, obviously going from to first is is not heard of much in in the NFL, and that's just uh, incredible turnarounds. Uh, but yeah, their offensive line just been playing lights out with Ryan Kelly, Quinn uh, Nelson, and all those guys. Let's talk about uh, some of those guys, uh, particularly Quinton Nelson. But let's also talk about the emergence of other guys like running back Marlon Mack and linebacker Darius Leonard, whom you were a huge fan of pre-draft. Uh, they've all been awesome for the Colts this year. You want to talk a little bit about kind of what they've meant to this team and how impactful they are? Well, Quinton Nelson, I think, is like the major reason for this tournament. The Colts uh, didn't have all the guys last year. I mean, there are some guys that were – not very good on the offensive line, and I mean, basically the guard position was where they're weakest. And bringing in Quinton Nelson, I mean, he he's made an all, he made the All Pro list. He's uh, he's a generational player, just like people said in the draft, and he uh, he's great. Like it, it really fixed them around. Marlon Mack also pretty good. I mean, I, I actually liked Marlon Mack last year, and then drafted him in fantasy uh, th- uh, this year because I, I had belief in him, and I, I mean. He he's really good. I feel like he's regressed as a pass catcher. Cause last year I thought uh, when his few snaps behind uh, Frank Gore that he was really good as a pass catcher. But I mean, as a runner, he's done really good. I mean, he strived with the help of Jordan Wilkins and uh, uh, his name is Naheem Hines. Naheem Hines. Uh, Naheem Hines is their pass catching back. I mean, they have a really good running back rotation right now, and they use pretty much all of them. And um, that's really helped Marlon Mack because Marlon Mack is a predominant starter there. I would say. Just uh, I I feel like they got a good thing going, especially with their offensive line helping uh, make the holes. And that Darius Leonard, I, I I'm gonna correct you a little bit. Darius Leonard, I actually had his like the second worst on my list when we were doing pre-draft. I I I, I was wrong. <laughs> I was I was very wrong because Darius Leonard is absolutely insane. Missed the game and still led the league in uh, the regular season in tackles by 22 tackles. He was the biggest Pro Bowl snub still to me. Biggest, I don't know how he doesn't make uh, make the Pro Bowl. I mean, he got respect on uh, all, the All Pro list. He, he's he's an All Pro, and actually, Quint, him and Quinton Nelson uh, be, being All Pros. This is the first time two rookies have been All Pro in their first year since 1965. I just thought I'd mention that because that's kind of uh, crazy. But they're both. Uh, very, very insane. Terry Leonard's just all over the field at every point in the game. He, uh, he's a difference maker. He's a uh, playmaker. He's just, he's. If this year is any uh, telling about anything going forward about his career, this guy is going to be doing great things for years to come. Yeah, they really look like they have a foundation built for a, a lot of success going forward. I mean, Nelson didn't he win uh, Offensive Rookie of the Week earlier this year too? He did. He did actually win Offensive Rookie of the Week, and I don't remember the last time a guard won it. I don't either, but he's been fantastic, and you talked about their running back, not running backs, Naeem Hines, uh, who am I forgetting, uh, Jordan Wilkins and uh, Marlon Mack. They've all been effective, and in the receiving game, it's typically been a lot of T.Y. Hilton. He's moving the ball, as is often the case. Eric Ebron has enjoyed a nice career resurgence, catching a 13 touchdowns, which is, which is more than he had in his entire career previously with the Lions. He's been fantastic, and they're also getting contributions from Chester Rogers and Dontrell Inman as well, and Ryan Grant, who was injured uh, possibly. But they're, they're without Jack Doyle, who was a breakout tight end uh, last season, they have been really great, though, and they've had a great turnaround season. Do you think they have enough to compete with the Texans, A, and do, do they have the ability to take this further to a Super Bowl, potentially? I feel like they can pass the Texans. They already beat them once this year, and they beat them in a the more important game. I feel like early on in the year, that game is definitely not telling because we were laughing at both these teams like, wow, garbage, and the Jaguars are just going to make it back to the playoffs just like they did last year. And then you see the Jaguars fall apart, and these teams just get it together. And the Colts won the more important game in Week 14. That's like way closer to now, and it's much more relevant to uh, to this game because it's it, 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 uh, more of the same players are playing, like injuries have happened now, and the teams have... Uh, performed differently. They've they've grown since then. So I feel like the Colts do have enough to compete with the Texans, especially because I'm not really high on the Texans right now. 
The Texans lost two games in a row toward the end and almost gave up the division to the Titans or the Colts. Uh, it was after a nine-game winning streak, and I mean, it's not very good. Like they're very streaky. Uh, I was out of the year 0 and three or 0 and four, I believe. And then they, they lost two games in a row after a nine-game win streak, and it wasn't against like that great a team. I and mean, they played really close to the Jets. Like the Jets aren't that good, so I'm not really high on the Texans right now. I think the Texans are like stagnant while the Colts are trending upwards for me. Yeah, I, I think they certainly have enough to beat the Texans. I think a little bit higher of the Colts right now with the way they played. The Texans have really only had three blowouts this year. When you look at all their games, they beat uh, the Dolphins pretty handily, 42-23. to 23. They beat the Jaguars 20-7 to 7 and 20-3. to 3. Those are kind of blowouts, but not crazy. And they beat the Titans 34-17 and the Browns 29-13. Those aren't like crazy, crazy wins. But, I, I mean, they have been winning, which is important. So, I think the Colts can definitely make it past this round. I don't know how much further they can go beyond that. Let's flip uh, sides here. Let's go look at the Texans. They're, the start of their season, as we mentioned, they were 0-3. Looked a lot like the 2017 team. And what followed was probably the quietest nine-game winning streak of all time. Like I said, they didn't blow teams out, but they went 11-2 and over their final 13. Why don't the Texans get the love that other teams are? And I might have just outlined that for you. Yeah, you. I think you actually put it perfectly. It's because they don't get the blowouts, and they're not that. It's. It's. I'm not gonna call it luck because they were playing really good, but I mean, a lot of their games were close. And it's like, okay, well, the other team could have won if they just did this a little bit differently, or it's just like that. The Texans just barely edged this, these guys out, or so against mostly uh, not that great teams. You know, like the the, the Texans get to play the, the Titans, the and and the Jaguars and the Jaguars absolutely uh, sucked this year and the, the Titans while actually finishing with a decent record were out with Marcus Mariota for uh, of games this year. It's just I don't know they they got a lot of easy games that they uh, were were able to uh, beat and I mean they weren't like beat them up like you said there's only like three blowouts this year. I mean they they aren't really exactly blowouts. Fourteen points is I mean it's a good amount. It's two touchdowns but it's not re it's not really the biggest blowout. But, um, yeah, I, I just don't – I don't think they get the respect. They probably deserve a little bit more than what's given to them, but it's just they're, – they're not as good as I think advertised. The problem is their offense – I think you'd agree with me. Their defense is good, but their offense is just not dynamic enough. I mean, Deshaun Watson is a good up-and-coming quarterback. They've got a decent ground game with Lamar Miller and Alfred uh, Blue. But, I mean, you, you start looking – at their uh, receiving yardage, they're the people who've caught passes. Uh, besides DeAndre Hopkins, and don't get me wrong, he's great, uh, you've got a bunch of question marks. I mean, they're, the guy with the second most catches on the team is Will Fuller, who played in seven games. Kiki Kute, Kute has 28 for 287. Lamar Miller has 25 for 163. Ryan Griffin, the tight end, has 24 for 305. I mean, there's a bunch of guys with 20 catches, but nobody's standing out here. Uh, Jordan Thomas has four touchdowns. Demarius Thomas, I believe he's uh, out for the year. He tore his Achilles, right? Uh, I don't know. I didn't hear that. I, I'm actually not sure on that. Oh, I remember there was fear, I think, about it. Let me see how stupid I sound here. But in any case, you want to talk a little bit about... I, I think it, it, a lot of it has to do with their lack of dynamic uh, playmakers on offense outside of DeAndre Hopkins. Uh, yeah, they're really lack on the team. And, I mean, what's the worst part is Deshaun Watson doesn't have time. The Texans' offensive line is still as bad as it was in seasons past. I believe I believe they have the second most sacks given up this year. It makes it hard for Deshaun Watson because I actually like Deshaun Watson. I feel like he doesn't get the, the respect he deserves because I, I feel like he's always forced to roll out and doesn't have time to throw. I feel like with a slightly better offensive line, Sean Watson would be dicing up this league. I mean, a lot of people do like him, so I'm, I'm not saying like he's like considered bad, but I feel like he could be way better with just a little bit better of an offensive line. But yeah, you feel like he's. Uh, just, a, I was gonna say you just you feel like oh, he's. Yeah. I was just saying like you feel like you don't. He's not reaching his limit like we saw last year. We saw everything he can do, and we we haven't seen as much of that this year in large part because it feels like he's always under pressure. Yeah, it's re it really sucks. One of these days, I used to think this about Russell Wilson, and it never happened. One of these, he's just going to get hurt because of his offensive line. And, I mean, 
like I just said, I always said that uh, uh, the Seahawks for the longest time because they never invested in offensive line. I mean, I guess it would paid off for them in some regard, but I just I think it's not. I feel like it's a bad idea to put uh, subject your young quarterback to that. It's it just I feel like I, I know teams can't just choose like oh, right, have a good offensive line now, but like I feel like they should have worked harder to build around it. I mean, uh, to be fair, they lost Derek Newton to two torn. Uh, two torn tendons in both his knees, and I mean he got picked up by the Saints now. But uh, and uh, Derek Newton was probably the best uh, lineman. And then they traded their other lineman. Ooh, oh no, I'm gonna forget his name. But uh, they traded him to to the Seahawks. Dwayne and Brown. That, that was their other best guy because they didn't want to pay him. And I feel like that was a mistake. They got rid of their two best tackles. I mean, to be fair with Derek Newton, he wouldn't have been back to like. The, I mean, the Saints just picked him up like four weeks ago, so he wasn't ready till then. But still. Uh, it definitely it definitely hurts them at, at the end of the day because of their um, because he doesn't have time to throw and that he doesn't have these weapons that every other team has. Like DeAndre Hopkins is one of the best wide receivers in the league, but behind him there's no one to like there's no one to take away some coverages. Like basically the idea for the Texans it's not, it might be DeAndre Hopkins is probably could be the best wide receiver in the league. I feel like DeAndre Hopkins gets double more than any other wide receiver in the NFL because there's no one else on the Texans team to respect besides maybe Deshaun Watson running out of the pocket. And that that makes it pretty hard. It makes it hard for the Texans to uh, get their offense going. And we've seen them slow down. I mean, it, it is a shame. You uh, did say Demarius Thomas tore his Achilles, and I, I did look it up, and you actually was an hour two weeks ago. And, I mean, that takes away, like, another guy. It, it's really unfortunate because with Demarius Thomas, it, it almost demanded respect. I mean, he hasn't been that great in, in the past season, but, I mean, he's still a, a receiver that's really good that demands a little bit of respect that should take away from DeAndre Hopkins. But it really hurts because they're untalented uh, behind. I mean, I loved Kiki Kuti, uh coming out of the draft. I looked at him. He was one of the uh, few wide receivers I looked at, and I, I thought he was he was going to be really good, but... He's just been hurt all year. Like he he's out for I think like four straight games in the middle after he finally got some playing time. He had one great game and then just was hurt ever since. I mean, he's hurt coming into this game. He's questionable. So it's just like he he's not uh, ever he's not been in his full strength. So he's not the guy to step up either. It's really seen they lost Will Fuller because Will Fuller absolutely insane. He he had like like every catch he got was a touchdown. I, I believe. I don't remember the numbers, but I mean, he had like twelve, like twelve catches, and like six of them were touchdowns. Like, like when he first came back this year, but just uh, insane. But yeah, and Hopkins right now, there's just nothing. Well, uh, Fuller has a very high touchdown percentage, like he did last year. Last year, seven of his twenty-eight catches were touchdowns. This year, four of his thirty-two were also touchdowns. They're going to need a lot more from Sammy Coates if they want to win this game. Sammy has just one yeah, catch. Yeah, Sammy Coates shouldn't be who they're dying on. That's not exactly ideal. He's caught one of their the two targets he's received this year. But in any case, uh, let's switch sides of the ball real quick. J.J. Watt has had a fantastic year. Can he take over this game like we've seen him do in playoff games past? I'm just worried, man. Like, the Colts, are, I, I don't think so. The Colts' offense line is just so good. I mean, you think about it. The Texans have got to play uh, the Colts twice. So the pass rush has gotten to see them twice. And, I mean, the Colts still have allowed the uh, least amount of sacks this year. And, I mean, sacks aren't everything. Pressure is about it. But the, that's the thing. The Colts haven't really allowed pressure because of their offensive line. I think it's going to be difficult. I, I really do because... Uh, I think the Colts have shown that they could keep up with uh, really good pressures like the Texans. It's just I don't know if that's going to be the difference maker in this game. I mean, uh, he, he definitely could be. Uh, he's definitely got to try his best, his best to be, but I just uh, I, I'm not exactly confident in it. It's going to be up to him and Clowney to provide pressure in this one. All right, uh, how do you see this one breaking out? Uh, I'm going to say that the Colts win 26-20. to 20. I just feel like the Texans' offense has stalled as late, and I just like the Colts in this one. Uh, what is your final score prediction? I'm taking the Colts to win 31-17. I just think they're 
in a lot better shape. They're a hotter football team. The Texans, they they you know they won a lot of games, but I'm not super convinced about the way they've played this year. And I think I'm going to have a couple bold predictions. Marlon Mack is going to have three touchdowns and 150 yards from offense. And J.J. Watt's going to have two sacks and a forced fumble, but I still don't think it's going to be enough. Uh, what's your final score? Uh, well, 26 to 20, but uh, my bold predictions are going to be Marlon Mack gets over 150 scrimmage yards, then uh, safety Mal- Malik Hooker sack, and that's really bold because he doesn't have a sack in his career yet. And then uh, Deshaun Watson throws two interceptions and for less than 200 yards. <sighs> All right, up to Saturday at 8.15, the five-seed Seahawks at 10-6 and six at the number four-seed Dallas Cowboys, who are also 10-6. and six. They played in week three of this season at Seattle. The Seahawks won that game 24-13. to 13. Uh, Not much as far as the injury report goes here. Uh, the Seahawks have fullback Trey Madden uh, injured and doubtful with the hamstring. And J.R. Sweeney, their guard, is questionable with a foot injury. The Cowboys have one player out, David Irving, their defensive lineman with an ankle injury. Tavon Austin and Darren uh, Thompson have groin injuries. They're questionable. And Xavier Suafialo, I believe, is how, how you, is that how you say it? Suafialo. Suafialo. He has an ankle injury, and he's doubtful. Let's get right into it. Seahawks, uh, another team that was thought to be in rebuilding mode, especially after their first two games dropping bad contests to the Denver Broncos and Chicago Bears. Uh, they turned it around. Uh, they won 10 games this year, and while the defense is not as good of, as the old Legion of Boom days, it's had a good uh, rank, and it has a solid pass rush that ranks just outside the top 10 and points allowed as well. Can they channel the success of years past and become a dominant unit once again? I feel like the Seahawks in the playoffs are just a team that you don't want to bet against. I feel like they know what they're doing. And even though they don't have, like, the same guys, they lost Earl Thomas earlier in the year. They lost, uh, they lost the whole region of Boom has already been uh, torn apart. They lost Richard Sherman in the offseason. But, I mean, they Bobby Wagner. If they got Bobby Wagner still, they should still feel good because he is an all-pro. He got 49 of the 50 votes for all-pro because he's just such a dynamic linebacker and just, that I feel like what's interesting about them is that this team doesn't look talented on paper, and they're still making it work. And I, they, uh, they have had like they've had a lot of injuries this year. They've, they've had a uh, oh no, his, his name is oh KJ Wright. That's uh, his name wasn't coming to me at first, but KJ Wright has been injured for most of the year, and he was one of their other star linebackers, and they're just still making it work. And their cornerbacks aren't like that great. They got. Uh, Shaq Griffin, and that's really all I know. Like, their cornerbacks just aren't, like, known quarterbacks, but they're making it work, and that's what I like about it. I feel like uh, they can be dominant because they've taken what they have, and they're using it. They're, they're making it. I keep saying it, they're making it work, and I think that they can be dominant in the playoffs. Yeah, I think uh, even though the personnel is different, the culture remains the same. And I can't say that they'll be an elite unit right now, but they have a formula that works and they know who their playmakers are. I think they're, they're a solid unit. I don't know if it'll be good enough to take them over the top, but I think they definitely have the foundation laid here. And the good news is that they're playing a team that has a very simu- similar formula to what the Seahawks run on offense. And that is a dominant ground game. So stopping them... In theory, is easy. You just have to stop the run. It's easier said than done, but at least they'll have an idea of what they have to do. On the other side, Russell Wilson and the Seahawks offense has returned to a formula we saw back in the early years of his career when they won a Super Bowl and went to two. A lot of running the football with some passes sprinkled in it here and there. Russell Wilson has had another good year, and the ground game has been terrific. And despite being sacked 51 times, the offensive line has shown vast improvement from where they were the last few years. Can they reach another level and make it back to the Super Bowl? I feel like uh, the offense in the whole is playing really well to it. I mean, they got a running back that's going with like Chris Carson and all those guys. It's just they're doing really, really well. Uh, I feel like uh, with us and the offensive line, like you said, has improved. I mean, they're still not very good in pass blocking, but they're very good at run blocking, which is, I mean, if, if they could do something good, I guess it is an improvement, especially from years past. I mean, I feel like they get all over the elbows. The Cowboys have the next five rush defense, so it's going to be hard. But I like to say they just establish a run game in this one. They should be able to to do it because 
they're just so good that they're averaging the most rushing yards per game in the NFL. And I feel like they could do it. They just had so much mobility. I mean, Russell Wilson isn't running like he used to in his career, but he's still dangerous when he does. They got Chris Carson out there. They got a bunch of other running backs. They obviously tried to rush up Penny earlier this year uh, in the first round. A lot of people question that, but I mean, with him and Chris Carson running together and uh, their other running backs, uh, I feel like they've just done really well. They change it up and make it work. But, um, and that's what they've always done. They've always, like, CJ Prosize and all guys. I mean, I believe Prosize is injured now. I think he's on a but they still, they kind of use running backs, like when they had Marshawn Lynch and stuff, such, and uh, Turbin. But uh, this offense, I think, can reach the Super Bowl. I think the Seahawks in the uh, playoffs are a dangerous team. You don't really want to. It really didn't see there. I, I feel like it was unfortunate for the Cowboys not to be shut with that. I feel like uh, it might come to bite them, but I think the Seahawks could reach the Super Bowl, but I don't think it's highly likely. I think their offense can win the Super Bowl, but they, they can't play in shootouts. That's the thing. This is not an offense that's built to come from behind, even with Russell Wilson playing as well as he has. This is a grounded and pounded kind of unit, just like the Dallas Cowboys, except, like you said, they have a variety of running backs, Chris Carson, Mike Davis, Rashad Penny. They have a bunch of different guys that can carry the rock and get involved. So at the end of the day, I think they do have what it takes because it has won it before, but uh, they're going to need to be uh, making sure that they don't play in any shootouts because then they'll be in trouble. The Cowboys are in a similar position. Dak Prescott, quarterback, endured what can only be described as an up-and-down season. A lot of his success, as we know, is predicated on the play of running back Ezekiel Elliott. How will they be able to run the ball in this one, and how will Dak Prescott fare? I feel like uh, if the run doesn't work, like Dak Prescott's just going to fail. He needs that run game to be decent in this one because, I mean, if Phillips just way the run, Dak as a thrower isn't – teams don't have to respect that. Dak hasn't really been that good as, as a thrower. He's uh, relied predominantly on Ezekiel Elliott, and uh, a lot of his yards come off of Ezekiel Elliott's screen passes because Elliott's just good with the ball in his hand. So I really think that if the Cowboys can establish the run, Dak Prescott will not fare well in, in the pass game because the Seahawks don't have to res- respect their – their one game, they don't really have nothing to respect, in my opinion. I mean, we have seen Dak Prescott uh, throw for a lot, uh, a good amount, like in the game following their trade for Amari Cooper, where they got uh, 31 points against the Redskins, and the Redskins are a pretty solid defense, so there is a chance that we get a good Dak, but I just feel like, I feel like if the Cowboys uh, won't, uh, if the Cowboys can't establish a run in this game, Dak Prescott be in trouble because I mean this offensive line typically the Cowboys offensive line was, has been uh, regarded as one of the best in the NFL in years past and they're at the bottom in sacks they've given up so many sacks this year and granted Zach Martin was hurt for a while their center was hurt for a while and just that's going to hurt me but I still don't I just their offensive line couldn't get Dak Prescott time to throw and that's part of the reason you, you don't have to respect Dak because he holds on to the ball for enough for the pass rush to hit home so I don't know that, that run definitely has to be established, uh, and that, that, how well the run is established is going to predict how well Dak does. What do you think? I agree, and I think uh, Dak, will, he still played well in some games where he's had to throw the football a lot. Case in point is his last playoff game against the Green Bay Packers. I think he'll fare solid. I think he'll do enough to win. A lot of it will do with Ezekiel Elliott and how well he runs the ball, but I think Dak Prescott is going to have a pretty solid game in this one. Uh, Amari Cooper has been kind of the MVP of the Cowboys on offense for the way that it's produced when he got into the lineup. And let's talk about what he's added to their team, but also let's not forget about their great defense, which includes a budding star in Leighton Van Der Esch. How far can either of these guys carry their respective units? I mean, the defense of the Cowboys has almost been guys this year. They've just played really, really well, especially against the run. Like I said, they're the number five rush defense. But, I mean, they got some really – really great guys uh, on this team. And like you, you mentioned, Leighton Van Der Esch has been a breaking star for them. Uh, obviously, that we wanted the Steelers to draft him, but he went er- really early in, in uh, this. The, I just feel like I feel like the defense might carry this Cowboys team to a victory here. That's what it's going to take, I, f- I feel like, because I don't believe in the, uh, in the Cowboys offense to win it. I need 
the Cowboys defense here to hold it down so that the offense can win it. I, I, I'm just um, – the defense itself can carry this team through the playoffs. I, it, it would be the reason they make it far is, is because of the defense. Cause I just Like I said, I don't trust in their offense. I mean, even with Amari Cooper and uh, Amari Cooper breaking out and being really good since he got here, I just – I just uh, think that the offense isn't as good as their defense. Like, their cornerbacks have just been great. They moved um I don't know why. I always want to call him Felix Jones. I always just forget his name. Their their number one cornerback was, used to be a safety, and he came out of the draft the year Shazier came out, because uh, I remember that because a lot of people wanted to draft him as an athletic safety that could be moved to cor- – uh, uh, he was a cornerback that could be moved to safety, and that's what the Cowboys did. The Cowboys made him a safety, and then this year they moved him back to cornerback, and it's, he's it, – no, then I just I always forget his name. I always just want to call him Felix Jones, like the old Cowboys running back and Steelers running back. Is it Byron Jones? I, I I'm just not. It's not going to come to me. But I really, I really like him as a quarterback. He since moving back to his original position, he's played lights out for them. He's kept up with some pretty good wide receivers. So I think that the Cowboys defense could uh, t- uh, take them through the playoffs. It's not exactly. It's Byron Jones. That's the quarterback name. It's Byron Jones. I I, I, I knew his name was that was confusing me, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that I think that this defense is going to be the reason they make it far if they do. What do you think? I agree. This is a defensive dominant team, and Van Der Esch has basically made uh, Sean Lee basically uh, inconsequential, which is kind of crazy when you really think about it. Uh, how do you see this game going? Uh, it looks like a pretty even matched team, uh, ma- evenly matched game. I'm going to pick the Seahawks to win 24-17. Uh, the Cowboys could easily win this game. It really depends on which offense the Cowboys come out with. The one that put up zero points against the Colts, the one that put up 31 against the Redskins. I think we get not good enough to win. Uh, I think that uh, the Seahawks win 24-17. to I'm just going to give you my bold prediction now. Uh, my first one is... Wilson dices up a solid defense, throwing three touchdowns, zero interceptions, and for over 300 yards. Then uh, the Cowboys' defense gets five sacks, which is what keeps them in the game. And then there's only two penalties total in this game. And uh, what are you, what is your final score prediction? And what are your bold predictions? I think the Cowboys are going to have a narrow 26-23 victory. I like them a lot better at home. If this were in Seattle, I'd take the Seahawks easily. But you know, it's weird. Both teams play football very similar. I just normally I would like the the quarterback who I think is going to be a Hall of Famer someday in Russell Wilson as opposed to Dak Prescott who is relatively unproven. But the Cowboys at home I like that one. I like the Cowboys and Jerry World in this one. I think both teams are going to go off uh, as a, as a combined from both teams. I think they'll have over 325 rushing yards, and I think Russell Wilson, shockingly over Dak Prescott, is going to be responsible for the game's only turnover, a fumble forced by Leighton Van Der Esch. And I think the Cowboys kick a last-second field goal to win this one and move on. All right, let's move on to Sunday's slate of games. We'll start with the 105 game between the between the 12 and 4 Chargers, who are the five seed, and the 10 and 6 Baltimore Ravens, who are the number four seed. They played just uh, two weeks ago. The Ravens won in LA 22 to get 22 to 10 in a game where I thought the Ravens could have won by like 40. Uh, Jatavius Brown is out for the Chargers. Brandon Meebane is doubtful for the Chargers, and running back Austin Eckler is questionable. For the Ravens, Alex Lewis, Chris Moore, and Tavon Young are all questionable. Uh, Chris Moore and Tavon Young were uh, both had injury designations. Young didn't practice Wednesday and Thursday and was limited Friday, and Moore didn't practice on Friday. Let's start with the Chargers, who are on the road. They have four losses. Only one of them has been on the road this season. Uh, they may be set up for, with a favorable path through the playoffs. Is this the most dangerous team playing in this round like everyone's saying they are? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is the worst matchup they could have asked for because the Ravens nearly blew them out the first time, and that's all I could have taken again. I think the Chargers are one and done team. I'm just going to say it's like that. They're just not a very good team in this game. I think that they're, I mean, it's really hard to say a 12 and 14 is overrated, but they are. I, I just don't like them. I, I still am just, I think they've gotten a lot of luck on their side this, through this season. I don't think they can keep up with the big boys. I, I feel like, uh, for the most part, they're not a very good team. 
Yeah, I haven't been overly impressed with them this year. Even in some of their wins, similar to the Texans, they haven't been that dominant, but they did have a huge win in Kansas City. So I suppose they're probably in better shape to be on the road as opposed to being at home. But still, I'm not very confident. This could be Phillip Rivers' last best chance to win a Super Bowl. Let's talk for a minute about Rivers' legacy and how important a championship could mean for it. Do you think he's one of the best? I do think he is one of the best. It's a shame that he does, he's probably not going to go down with a Super Bowl under his chest, but he's definitely one of the, the best uh, quarterbacks to ever play. Definitely, I'd definitely put him top 20. Uh, I, I'm not sure where exactly I would have him, but so I'm being the best thing, top 20. I feel like he could push maybe to top 15, though. So uh, I, I really do think highly of Philip Rivers. It's just uh, I, I, if, this, if he wins the Super Bowl here, yeah, he's a Hall of Famer. It, it's how it goes. Uh, cause, I mean, you you look at him, Eli Manning's probably going to be a Hall of Famer, which is disappointing when you think about it. But, I mean, he has two rings, and that's what people are going to con- con- consider when voting for him. And they're going to look at Philip Rivers and like, well, he was never able to translate his great play into a championship. And it's not really his fault, but uh, it, it's going to hold him back from uh, Hall of Fame voting, at least for years, if, if he even makes it. It's going to be rough. Uh, for him, I really, I, I hope he does, but it, it is going to be rough. But if he gets a championship, if he wins the Super Bowl this year, uh, I think he'll he'll have an easier uh, easier path into the Hall of Fame. Do you vote him to the Hall of Fame now? If you had to vote today, uh, like first ballot? Well, no, I'm saying like if he was on the ballot today and you were voting whether or not to put him in the Hall of Fame, would you put him in or not? I would. I feel like his play. Him not winning a championship is not his fault. Chargers have a, had a lot of ineptitude around him, and I, I feel like he's he should probably make it there before Eli Manning, but it's not how, how it's going to work. I agree with you. I think he is absolutely a Hall of Famer, and I think he's criminally underrated throughout his career because of how inept his team has been and the dysfunction that goes on with that organization. But I think a Super Bowl would make him a lock as a Hall of Famer. Let's flip sides here. The Baltimore Ravens were left for dead at 4-5. and five. They usurped the Steelers' Super, uh, Super Bowl chances by passing them in the crown in the race for the AFC North crown. They won six of their last seven with their only loss coming in Kansas City in overtime. We know about the dominant defense that they have. Are they the best in football, and are there really any holes in it? I'm going to say that they're the second best. I really like their defense a lot. I love Eric Weddle. I think uh, I love C.J. Mosley. I hope the Steelers make a run for him this offseason. I like Marlon Humphrey. I, I, I like, like They have a good guy in every single area on the field. I like Sidari Smith. I, I like uh, Brent Odin. I like, I like the guys. I like, like almost all the guys they have. Obviously, Terrell Suggs has been playing forever. I like him. Just, they got a lot of good piece on their defense. They work well together. They play well together. And, I mean, one of their only problems this year is they're not forcing turnovers, but that doesn't matter when they're not allowing the points in the end. So, it's just, uh, but that's why they're number two, because they really don't get the turnovers. Uh, they almost had the same exact problems had just with a much better defense everywhere else. Uh, I just feel like, I feel like the Bears are still the best defense, in my opinion, in this league, but they're definitely up there. The Ravens are a very potent defense. They, they're going, they're hard to against the hard to run against there's not much you could really uh do to beat them because they're they're still they don't allow the yet but that's what makes them so good and uh i think that this defense might carry them all the way to the super bowl it's certainly a super bowl caliber defense you think of everyone in the afc the only defense that i think comes close to them would be the uh either the texans or the chargers right yeah yeah that's they're not really close <laughs> Like, they're good defenses, but I wouldn't call those defenses. I wouldn't put them in the same class as Baltimore's defense. Uh, yeah, no, not, they're definitely not on the same tier. Baltimore is, like, the, clearly the best. They've got, uh, they've got a great scheme. On the AFC side. They've got a great scheme, and they have great players that know how to play within it. And like you said, they have playmakers on every level. And they're dominant. Not, the only thing they don't don't do is force a ton of turnovers. But I mean, they don't. They haven't needed to. That's the thing. I don't really see many holes in it. And as we know, uh, great defense usually uh, helps win a championship. And I think theirs is good enough to win it. 
The other side, the clear, obvious storyline has been the offense since Lamar Jackson took over for Joe Flacco uh, following the last Steelers uh, game against the Ravens. Their offense has become a very run, run dominant unit, and Jackson has been a huge part of that. He has finished second on the team in rushing yards, most rushing yards ever for a quarterback, by the way, uh, or rushing attempts. And as a team, they have just under 2,500 yards rushing. Uh, we haven't seen numbers that high since the Steelers in the mid-1970s. How dangerous is Lamar Jackson, and can he do the unthinkable, lead a, a Ravens team that was 4-5 and five to a championship? I think, and uh, what's really, uh, I'm going to tell you straight up that I hate it. I don't understand how it works, and I said ever since Lamar Jackson started that the next team is going to shut them down. Oh, they rushed. He didn't throw for that much in this game. He's based on his run. It's not going to work. Next game. Oh, it worked again. It's not going to work the next game. The third game, that's what scary works. I don't know why it works. I don't get how teams are just not, like, to me in my mind, he was trying to respect one thing, and that's a run game, and they just can't stop it. And that's why I think that the Ravens' offense is going to take them to a uh, Super Bowl. I, there's, there's just, in my mind, I keep saying that they should be stopped, but you know what they don't do? They don't get stopped. There, there's just something that the Ravens' offense is doing that is, is absolutely baffling teams, and it's just impressive. It's just impressive to me because I still, like, like I, I keep saying, I just don't understand how it's working, but it is. Uh, I, and I'm hopping on the train. Like I feel like I feel like this Ravens team is very dangerous. I, I said it like three weeks ago. This was the team I would not want to see in the playoffs. I would rather, if I'm another team, I would rather see the Steelers because the Steelers play. Um, this Ravens team, as soon as they get in front, you're you're in trouble. Like that, that, that's it. Like if, if they're in front of you, you're in trouble, and that's that, that's a problem. They haven't been going down. They've been uh, their defense has been playing lights out, and then on offense, they've just been doing their thing. They've been rushing the ball and teams can't stop it. And I, I, I really, truly believe that this team might make it to the Super Bowl. Uh, even even with the Chiefs and Patriots being there, and uh, being uh, the Chiefs are a super pile, and the um, Patriots are always hard to beat in the playoffs. I just, I, I look at this team, and I'm like, how do teams beat it? Because they should be beating it, but they're not. So that's, that's what I think. I'll tell you how you beat it, and it's, granted, easier said than done. You need to go up by two touchdowns on this team. Uh, we've seen Lamar Jackson make great plays throwing the football, but let's be honest, Austin. The Ravens, if they get in a shootout, they're not winning that game. No, nope, no chance. And that, that's the problem. Their defense doesn't allow shootouts. So if you're the Chargers, you're trying to do everything you can after this past game that they played against you to try to score early. Even three points, it's tough. But if you can stay ahead of them, try to get them off balance a little bit, that's really your only chance because that you know if you play to their style, you're going to lose most likely. So uh, at the end of the day, I think it's a tough matchup. I think Phillip Rivers getting another week to see this defense will really help. But at the same time, I don't think it's going to be enough. I think the Ravens are going to win and win big because we saw just a few weeks ago how that game turned out. And 22-10 to 10 did really not tell the story of how dominant the Ravens were. I think the Ravens win 31-13 to 13 in this one, Austin. And I think Phillip Rivers has kept under 250 passing yards and throws three picks, while Lamar Jackson has two touchdowns and totals 400 yards passing slash running. So combine those two. Uh, you see the game going a similar way? Yeah, I have it almost exactly like you. I feel like the Ravens will win this, will win this big. Uh, the Ravens could have blown out the Chargers last time, and I think, I think they do this time. I think they pulled the Chargers to zero points until late in the game. So I have the Ravens winning... 23 to 8 with the uh, Chargers going for a late two point conversion just because they're down by so much. So uh, then for my bold prediction, I'm saying Lamar Jackson has more rushing yards than passing yards. I'm going to say the Chargers don't get a sack or a turnover. And then uh, my third one is that Derwin James is the only bright spot for the Chargers as he knocks his over 10 tackles. But that's really it. I'm just, I'm not a big fan of the Chargers team, and I really love this Ravens team for uh, going forward. All right, let's uh, get to the final game of the weekend here. Uh, it's going to be a 4:40. Uh, it's going to be a 4:40 game against the uh, between the Philadelphia Eagles, who are nine and seven, and uh, the number three seed Chicago Bears, who are 12 and four. Uh, they last met last season in November. The Eagles won over the Bears 31 to three. A lot has changed with both teams since then, though. 
You want to take? Uh, uh, you want to cover the injury reports here for both teams? Yeah, sure. Uh, Eagles have not uh, let out their final injury report, but uh, DJ Alexander with a hamstring and Michael Bennett with a foot, Sidney Jones with a hamstring, and Carson Wentz with a back did not participate Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, Cox with a knee, Jason Peters with a quadricep, Sumalo uh, with a chest, and Mike Wallace with an ankle were limited on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, Avante Maddox with an oblique and Wendell Smallwood hand were added to the injury report on Thursday as limited participation, uh, participants to practice. Then uh, Nick Foles' ribs was limited on Wednesday, but it was a full part to, uh, to been on Thursday, so he's good. Uh, the Bears have put out their final injury report, so Aaron Lynch is doubtful. Uh, Houston Carson, Eddie Jackson, and Bilal Nichols are questionable. All right, in Philadelphia, man, it's time to party like it's 2017. The Eagles are red hot. They've won five of their last six. Has the reemergence of Nick Foles following yet another injury to Carson Wentz it has the Eagles back in the playoffs. Can Nick Foles do it again? I think he can. The Eagles have just been, they're a weird team. They play better when they're, people say that they're worse. And with Carson Wentz getting hurt, be, uh, especially with how we saw Nick Foles playing early in the season, uh, it's just they thought they should be worse, and they just decided that they were going to win five of their last six games and get, uh, get to the playoffs anyway with help from the, the Chicago Bears who are they're playing because obviously the Bears beat the Vikings which allowed the Eagles to make the playoffs but uh, I feel like this is another team that you didn't really want to see coming into the playoffs because they're not they don't make sense but it's, it's almost like the Ravens but like it's different here because Nick Foles plays bad for the beginning of the year and then just gets in a situation like we saw last year and gets the start and then they just they know how to win it, it was it, like they start playing really good, they know they beat all their opponents as underdogs. Like they, they were, they were underdogs throughout the entire playoff last year, and they're ready for it. That's what makes this a dangerous game. They're ready for this, and I mean, if the Bears don't have Eddie Jackson, it's gonna hurt. I, I think Eddie Jackson is a big piece. He's, uh, he's having another really good season. Like his second season, he's just as a star safety. So, I, I feel like Nick Foles, if, if Eddie Jackson doesn't uh, doesn't play. Nick Foles might dice him up, even though this defense is what I consider the best defense in the league. Because they get the turnovers, they get the sacks, they they they're stingy on yards sometimes, and uh, they held like the Rams like 14 points. Just it, it, uh, it's just the Eagles are such a weird team that I think that if there's any team to do it, it is it's the Eagles because they're just so weird. The Eagles are a very dangerous team, and look, if if they did it before, they can certainly do it again. I'm completely confident that they can do it, even with the injuries that they suffered this year, which is almost worse than what they had last year. In fact, it is worse. Uh, they have to be the most dangerous team in that FC, right? Oh, 100%. This team, you don't really know what you're going to get. It's like you don't really understand how Nick Foles is doing what he's doing. and just It's really dangerous. They're not a team you wanted to see in the playoffs. The Bears have been solid, but not spectacular on offense. The creativity from head coach Matt Nagy has given them life. Who's the most important player on offense? Is it Mitchell Trubisky? Is it Tariq Cohen? Is it Jordan Howard? Is it someone else? I'm going Tariq Cohen. I think Tariq Cohen does most of the work for the offense, and he just does so much. He catches catches pass out of the backfield. He runs. He's just really fast. He's agile. I think he is one of their most dangerous guys. Not only that, he's dangerous on special teams, too. So I think Tariq Cohen, as a whole, is the most important player they have on the entire team, actually, uh, even, okay, on offense. I'll definitely say on offense. Now I'm, I'm thinking, I'm like, Leo Mack is probably the reason why they're 12-4 and four this year. But uh, definitely on offense, he, he is their most important player. Who do you think? I'm going to go with Cohen as well. I feel like he is uh, he's the most important offensive player. He, just, he adds so much uh, as far as uh, dynamic ability as a guy that can run to the edges or a guy – that can sneak out of the backfield and catch some passes. He's been really an important player, and Trubisky's been solid, but I'm not super sold on him just yet. Uh, he's been solid, but not great. Does he have the ability to win a championship, or you know, how's the championship going to go for the Bears? Is he going to have to win a couple games, or can he just be win a championship by just doing, you know, the game manager stuff, just enough to win, you know, not turn it over. I think he could uh, go on to win the championship with just the game management because I think the Bears are all based around their defense here. 
And the defense just has to keep teams behind. It has to keep teams from scoring points, and I think they could do that because, like I said, I think they're the best defense in the league right now. And just, uh, I, I feel like Mr. Trubisky has been pretty solid. Like, he's he's not having, I feel like, the best way to put it, I feel like he reminds me of Marcus Mariota in the sense, sense that I don't really, like, think Marcus Mariota is a great quarterback. I think he's workable, and that's what I think with Mitchell Trubisky. But they were, like, both trapped at, like, the same same point, too. It's just I feel like Trubisky is workable. I feel like Trubisky does do some good things, but he also does a lot of not-so-good things. He's not as accurate. He's He's got an arm, but to be fair, his wide receivers aren't. All, all that. I, I always, I was never high on Allen Robinson, and I thought they overpaid him when they brought him in. Taylor Gabriel was a tier two wide receiver for the Falcons, and I mean, he only had one like breakout year, and he's he's done all right, and really it. I mean, Kevin White's always been injured since he's been drafted to this team, and there's one more wide receiver I'm forgetting, and I feel like it's their number one wide receiver, but I feel, I, I I'm just Allen Robinson, Taylor Gabriel. I don't know. All right. Well, I'm, well, just not, I'm not high on their, their wide receivers, but that's not the point. The point is, Trey as long as their too. defense plays well, Mitchell Trubisky just has to manage this game, and I think that they could go, uh, run through the playoffs. There's Trey Burton, too. Uh, he's not a receiver, but... Ah, uh, yeah. Trey Burton, Adam Shaheen came back, like those guys. Yeah, I mean, uh, I feel like Trubisky is a solid player, but you'd agree with this assessment. He kind of has a low ceiling right now. Yeah, yeah, no, he's 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 not he's not exactly he's not going to be like a Hall of Fame quarterback at at the rate he's playing. He's just he's playing like um like Joe Flacco, just manages the game. Yep, and uh, I think he can win it, but I also think he's going to need to have one game where he wins a shootout, or at least a game that's closer to a shootout than a defensive struggle. <coughs> Excuse me. He has done it this year. He has done it. He had a game where he threw five touchdowns. So it's it's not like it's out of the question. It's not like he's uh, he's completely uh, he could be ruled out as not being able to do it. He has done it. I forget which team he did it against. So. Buccaneers. Buccaneers uh, way well, back yeah, in a very bad defense is what you're saying. That was way back in week four. Uh, that accounted for uh, not that that means that accounted for five of his 24 touchdowns. Meaning otherwise he'd have just 19 this season. Uh, let's go to the other side of the ball quickly. Khalil Mack, he's been their MVP for sure. The centerpiece of a resurgent defense that is now one of, if not the best in the league. Now, I, you kind of already answered this. You think it's the best in the playoffs. Is it the best in the league? And just, it, it probably can take them all the way, can it? Yep, best defense in the league, best defense in the playoffs, therefore. And it's just, it's really around trading for Khalil Mack. I mean, they got a great deal for that. I mean, they the Raiders said they wanted three first-round picks, and, like, they got back, like, a second and a fifth for giving up those. Like, it wasn't even just – I think this trade was just miserable for them. And now they have a generational player that is going to end up in the Hall of Fame. I could say that – I think I could say that confidently, even, even though he's young in his career. If, if he just needs to keep doing what he's doing. He's going to be – but he's going to be a great one day, or considered a great – and just uh, – he, I think he is the most dangerous uh, defensive player in the playoffs. I think – that he's the guy that teams need to look out for the most. I mean, like, who else is competing? Darius Leonard? J.J. Watt? Like, I mean, I, you, I feel like you can make a case for Darius Leonard. feel like you could. But I just think Khalil Mack is just, it's just something else. Khalil Mack gives you that pass rush ability. He has, he's a really good tackler. It's just, I, I don't know. I think Khalil Mack is the most dangerous defensive player in the playoffs. What do you think? Are you referring to this round or all of the playoffs? I was I was looking at all the playoffs because I, I couldn't think of another. You're probably gonna have someone that's uh, better, but I was thinking the entire playoff. I was just thinking Aaron Donald. Oh uh, yeah, Aaron Donald. Yeah, no, you're, they, you're probably right. Let's be fair; they're probably one A and one B. I mean, uh, but we we can get more into Aaron Donald later. So. This is probably the most interesting matchup in my opinion this week. I think this will be the best game. Uh, do you think the Bears can pull out pull out a win, or do you think the Eagles will get the upset win? Uh, if I was the Bears, I would hate playing this game, but I still think they win 20-17 to 17 in a very close one. I feel like the Eagles have the lead for most of the day, too. And I'm going to say uh, for both shoot Eddie Jackson plays and gets two interceptions, uh, Mitchell Trubisky also throws two picks, but also loses a fumble. And then Tariq Cohen and Jordan Howard combined for over 250 scrimmage yards. 
So what are your uh, final score and bowl predictions? Uh, my bold predictions, I think Mitchell Trubisky throws a pick six in this one. I think Elshon Jeffrey's going to have a big day for the Eagles. He has 125 yards and two receiving touchdowns. And I think the Eagles are going to do it. They're going to have some of that playoff magic again for the second year in a row. They'll pull out the upset win in Soldier Field in a close one, 27-21. to 21. All right, before we wrap this one up, let's talk about uh, our X Factors, if you will, for the game. Let's uh, go over uh, each team that's playing in this round and give me uh, one player that you're really going to be paying attention to for each team. Uh, so go ahead. Sure. For the Colts, it's Darius Leonard. I mean, he's a tackle machine, and he's going to be keeping them in the game on defense. For the Texans, J.J. Watt is their star, and he's going to need to uh, try and do something against this offensive line if they want to try and win this game. For the Seahawks, it's Doug Baldwin. I feel like if uh, the Seahawks can have both the running and passing game established against a really hard defense, uh, he's going to be the one to help with it, and it's going to be the reason they win. For the Cowboys, it's Byron Jones. Uh, obviously, the star cornerback I talked about, I couldn't remember his name, and I realized I wrote it down uh, down here, but uh, I think he's going to be the difference maker. Uh, Chargers, it's Melvin Gordon. He's going to... He's got a nasty stiff arm, and if he if they want to keep up with the Ravens, he's going to need to have a nasty game. Uh, for the Ravens, because... All, uh, because of that, I pick C.J. Mosley, the middle linebacker, to stop the run uh, for the Alshon Jeffrey. With, with Nick Foles, Alshon Jeffrey plays at another level. It's just like when Alshon Jeffrey had Jay Cutler, and uh, Jay Cutler used to lob it up and just hope. But uh, I, I think that he will be the difference maker. And for the Bears, I pick Khalil Mack. Khalil Mack is going to be the guy if uh, they win this game against a pretty solid uh, Eagles offensive line. Who are your X factors? I'm going with... For the Colts, Marlon Mack, he's been uh, one of their best offensive players this season and has been a solid breakout player. I think the way he plays can really impact the game for the Colts, whether they win or lose. For the Texans, I'll go with the, their running back as well, Lamar Miller. Uh, their offense is really all about running the football since DeAndre Hopkins is their only receiving threat. Miller's going to need to have a big day if the, if the Texans are going to win. The Seahawks, I'm going with the receiver opposite Doug Baldwin just because I feel like the Cowboys are going to do everything they can to scheme Doug Baldwin out of the game. So it's going to be up to Tyler Lockett to come up with a few big plays in order to win. Leighton Vander Esch for the Cowboys, uh, he's a super X factor for me, being able to stop the Seahawks rushing attack and keeping an eye on good old Russell Wilson back there. I think he could have a big game. For the Chargers, I'm going with Joey Bosa. Uh, if they do get ahead against the Ravens, they're going to have to contain Lamar Jackson, and they struggled with that before. Bosa has been one of the best uh, defensive players for the Chargers in recent memory. He's going to need to have a big game. For the Ravens, I'm going running back Gus Edwards. He exploded kind of the way Alex Collins did a few years ago. Gus Edwards is just a big physical downhill runner, and he's been really good leading the team in rushing yards. Uh, I think he's their X factor. For the Eagles, I'll agree with you, Alshon Jeffrey. He's just a much better player with Nick Foles in the lineup instead of Carson Wentz. And finally, I'll go with Mitchell Trubisky, the quarterback. I know that's kind of a cop-out, but at the end of the day, he can – I think we, we both said it. You know, he doesn't have to win the Bears a game most likely, but he just has to not lose it. So I'll have my eyes on him for sure. So closing thoughts on this year's wild card round and just a brief overview of the playoffs as a whole. Uh What's your Super Bowl prediction for uh, Super Bowl 43, or 43, 53? Let me pick one that likely a lot of people aren't picking, but I truly believe. I think two teams make out a wild card weekend and make it to the Super Bowl, and that's the Ravens and the Bears. I think that uh, in, a, in a year that's been defined by offensive superpowers, but one of the, some of the few defensive ones come out as uh, the, uh, the reigning champions for the AFC side and the NFC side, and that's why I'm picking the Ravens and the Bears, because they have probably the best and the second-best defense. And I'm picking the Bears to win the Super Bowl, because I think that I feel like their defense against uh, the Ravens' offense will be the only one that could actually stop what the Ravens are doing, because they're the only one that's good enough, because they could force the turnovers, whether it be the fumbles and the such. And the Ravens have been bad with fumbling, because, I mean, when you're that much, you're going to fumble. It's just how it is. I feel like the Bears will, will capitalize in, in the end. So I'm picking the Ravens with the Bears, with the Bears winning the Super Bowl, which I, I, I can't imagine a lot of people are picking. I think I feel like Saints and Chiefs are, have been favorites. What are you picking? I'm sticking with my midseason pick, which is Rams over Patriots, and I still see it going down that way uh, just because, you know, I, I feel like it's not something many people are talking about with both teams looking sluggish. But they're both getting a week off, and they'll both host a home playoff game. All they have to do is win once, and they'll be into the conference championship game. 
So I'll take the Rams. I think they'll get things together, and I think the Patriots are just going to do what they do, and the Chiefs will lose their game. So that means the, that the Patriots will host the AFC Championship game once again, and they'll move on. So I'll take the Rams to beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Other NFL news, uh, you want to talk a little bit about what's been going on? Yeah, uh, there's this rule change that's been set to be approved. Uh, it's not very common, but if there's a potential change of possession in the end zone upon review but no clear recovery, the ruling will be no, no longer be an incomplete pass. Instead, defense will be rewarded a safety. Uh, I, it seems like a rule that should have been happened that for an example's purpose is if a quarterback threw what was originally ruled an incomplete pass, uh, uh, then a coach challenges, ch- uh, challenges it, and it's uh, turned out to be a fumble, but you don't see if the defense got it or not, or if the offense got it. Originally, it was just ruled an incomplete pass, which it, that, I, that didn't really make sense to me. Obviously, they, uh, if, it's, if it's ruled a fumble uh, originally, well, how can you call it an incomplete pass just because the defense didn't recover it? Uh, but now it will be a safety automatically at worst. So if, the, if there's an uh, inconclusive on who recovered it, it will be a safety for the defense. All right, and then 15 Hall of Fame finalists have been announced. Uh, they are Steve Atwater, Champ Bailey, Tony Baselli, uh, Isaac Bruce, Don Coryell, Alan Fanica, Tom Flores, Tony Gonzalez, Steve Hutchinson, Edrin James, Ty Law, John Lynch, Kevin Ma- Maui, uh, Ed Reed, and Richard Seymour. Pick five out of that list for your Hall of Fame. Uh, Ed Reed is definitely guaranteed. I think t- Tony, Gon- uh, Tony Gonzalez is also guaranteed, so that's two. I'm going to say this is finally the year that Ty Law makes it. I think well, after that, it gets really rough. Um, ooh, I think Sam Bailey. I'm going to pick Sam, ba- Sam Bailey as four. And then, ooh, I want to go Allen. But I think I'm going to pick Isaac Bruce. I feel like those are the five. Who are your five? I think I agree with you. The locks are Ed Reed and Tony Gonzalez. I think this is the year Alan Fanica gets in. I think that this is tough. I think they might go with Tony Baselli just because it's also he's a tackle and there's four offensive linemen that are all deserving, so I think they'll get two this year. And I, I think I'll go Isaac Bruce. I want to see Don Coriel, but I think it's going to be Isaac Bruce. I think this is going to be the year for him. So uh, you heard it here first on the Stronger Than Steel podcast. By the way, Heinz Ward did not make it again, as you heard. Uh, looking less and less likely every year he's going to make it. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but it'd be like that. Just one last question before we go. Is there a team you're rooting for playoffs going forward? I typically don't root for teams in the playoffs when the Steelers aren't in it. Usually I just root against teams. So, like, in order, it's like the Patriots and Ravens are at the top of the teams I root against. And then uh, as far as teams I wouldn't mind seeing to win. Oh, and, and the Cowboys. Cowboys are also up there for teams I don't want to see win. As far as teams that I would, wouldn't mind seeing win... I wouldn't mind the Bears, Chargers I wouldn't hate, uh, wouldn't mind the Texans or Colts. I don't really want to see the Eagles win again. I I guess I'm, I'm definitely against the Patriots, the Ravens. Um, I'm also against the Cowboys and the Eagles. Uh, those are the teams that I really don't want to win. What about you? Fair enough. For me, um, because they're so similar to the Steelers, I'm going to pick the Saints. I already really like them as a team, so I'm going to to make my playoffs a little bit more interesting. I'm going to root for the Saints with, I guess, your your buddy Jesse, because I, I don't know. You look at the teams, and you just look, you see Hall of Fame quarterback. You see now with Jalen Samuels breaking out, two really solid running backs on both teams. I mean, I, I would pick Alvin Kamara uh, any day, but I'm just, uh, for comparison's sake, a really good offensive line, a a uh, really a star wide receiver uh, that actually was that's been an all pro. It's just I feel like that they draw so many similarities, at least on offense. That uh, I, I feel I, and I I just like the Saints team, so I'm gonna I'm gonna root for them, and then I'm gonna be rooting like you said against the Ravens, Patriots, and Cowboys. Alrighty, well I think uh, that'll wrap things up here on this edition of the Stronger Than Steel podcast. If you have any questions, feel free to email the show at stronger than steel podcast at gmail dot com. Check out our website listed in the description below, uh, strongerthanstealnfl.blogspot.com. Austin, thank you so much for joining me today, and uh, I guess uh, enjoy the playoffs as much as you can. I will. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. 
You have been listening to Stronger Than Steel Podcast.